Okay, welcome back to part two of our introduction to the presentation of self in everyday life by Irving Goffman. At this stage, you should have a basic understanding of some of the key terms associated with Goffman's theory of dramaturgy. Let's continue to deepen our knowledge of this excellent book, shall we? Okay. So first off, Goffman distinguishes between what he calls sincere and cynical actors. This is kind of an odd distinction because the truth is that you can never be certain whether another person is being sincere or cynical in their behavior. Of course, they want you to believe that they are a sincere actor in much the same way that you want others to believe that you are a sincere actor when you act in front of them. But we can never be sure of them either way, and they can never be sure of us. So in this light, whether or not a performance is real is actually neither here nor there. Our interactions can never be said to be really real, if that makes any sense. Now, a sincere actor makes people genuinely believe in his or her performance. I am acting like a professor now, and I believe that I am a professor. Cynical actors, on the other hand, recognize that their performances are just a masquerade. They're just for show. We've all been in situations like this before where we are pretending to be something that we are not or someone who we are not. Cynical actors are ubiquitous in the workplace. Whenever money is involved, people tend to become cynical. Salespeople, for example, are archetypical cynics. They pretend to be your friend, not because they are your friend, but because they want you to buy something from them. They pretend to have your best interests at heart, but they don't really care. They just want you to buy something so that they can get a sale. Of course, not all cynical actors delude others out of purely self-interest. Sometimes we put on performances to help others. For example, I may pretend to be interested in what a student has to say, but only to make the student feel listened to. I know deep down that I'm feigning interest, but I do it anyway because I don't want to offend the student. In any case, Goffman argues that we constantly move back and forth between these sincere and cynical performances and that the line between them is, let's say, extremely blurred. So remember that Goffman frames all social interaction in terms of the theatrical metaphor. We're all just acting in a play called life. Of course, a big part of any theatrical production is the stage, or as Goffman calls it, the dramaturgical front. This is the place where our performances unfold. Goffman defines the front as the part of a performance that takes place in front of others and employs equipment to foster a definition of the situation. A front is literally any place where we interact with others. A workplace, a school, a university, a park, a home, a restaurant, etc. The setting refers to that part of the front that includes furniture, decor, physical layout, scenery, and or stage props. Think of the last time you entered a retail shop. What did the setting look like to you? How was the room decorated? What kind of furniture and props were used? You might not know this, but companies put a huge amount of effort into optimally configuring the environment so as to promote consumption. The physical appearance of the retail space, including the appearance of the employees themselves, are important factors in determining whether or not a customer buys something. Okay, so personal front refers to the part of the front 
that is connected to the individual, including appearance and manner. So your appearance refers to, for example, the clothes that you wear or the way that you style your hair or whether or not you use makeup, etc. Your manner refers to the way in which you behave in front of others. A salesperson, for example, might wear attractive looking clothes and perfume or cologne uh, and a smile. They may be excessively polite and respectful towards the customer. So Goffin points out that we expect consistency between the setting, the appearance, and the manner of people. So for example, if we enter a doctor's office, that would be the setting, and we see a man in a white coat or a woman in the right coat, uh, we probably could expect him or her to behave like a doctor. And we would be shocked if he or she told us, yeah, you're dying, bro. No, I'm just kidding. You're fine. Stop crying. You know, that kind of behavior would be inconsistent with our expectations of how a doctor should behave. Okay. So Goffman then moves on to define what he refers to as dramatic realization and idealization. Dramatization refers to a dramatic accentuation of certain parts of a performance for purposes of creating the right effect and instilling a sense of confidence in one's performance. So for example, a professor when lecturing might take a long pause during his lecture to create the impression that he is thinking deeply when in fact maybe he's not thinking deeply at all he's only thinking about dinner plans for later in the evening now i confess i've done this myself idealization refers to when we present idealized versions of ourselves to others so for example we wear status symbols like expensive jewelry and luxury clothing in order to project ourselves into a higher class than we actually belong. We buy counterfeit LV bags so that people around us think that we are better off than we really are. This is very much central to um, Thornstein Veblen's Theory of the Leisure Class, another great book uh, that you're welcome to read if you'd like. So Goffman also notes that we can also present idealized versions of a lower class self, not just an upper class self. So for example, a PhD in history might intentionally conceal her PhD so that she can get a job that is beneath her education. Okay, secret consumption. So this refers to when we conceal aspects of our appearance or behavior that are inconsistent with the image that we're trying to project. For example, a CEO of a major company might place uh, a copy of The Sun inside the Financial Times so that people think he's reading about stocks and stock prices, but in fact, he's actually just catching up uh, on the latest gossip. One time when I attended a graduation ceremony, I saw a professor looking at his smartphone but it was concealed within the list of graduates. So from the audience perspective, they thought that he was attentively paying attention to the graduates as they crossed the stage, but he was actually just reading the news. So this is a good example of secret consumption. The impression of infallibility refers to those who, you know, situations where they say, oh, I meant to do that right? So a street performer might drop a bowling pin she was juggling, and of course she meant to do that, even though it was an accident. So Goffman also highlights the importance of audience segregation. This means keeping different audiences separate. A classic example, how about the man who might want to keep his wife and his mistress separate, uh, and it would be especially bad if they confronted each other in his place of work. So you have three different audiences 
flashing at once. Now that could get ugly. Okay, so let's take a look at a clip from one of my favorite TV shows, Seinfeld. As you watch it, I want you to think about how it's related to the presentation of self in everyday life in the context of the workplace. Catalog is all about how to score in a foreign country. Yeah, what do you do all day? Not that much. Uh -huh. I thought that new promotion was supposed to be a lot more work. Yeah, when the season starts. Right now I sit around pretending that I'm busy. How do you pull that off? I always look annoyed. <laughs> yeah, when you look annoyed all the time, people think that you're busy. <laughs> think about it. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. do. Looks busy. He looks very busy. Yeah. I know what I'm doing. Like Mr. Wilhelm gave me one of those little stress dolls. <laughs> All right. Back to work. <laughs> we just got the final budget numbers. We went over budget on some of the items, but I don't think there's going to be a problem. I'll let you get back to work, George. <laughs> taking work a little too seriously. Well, I've got a lot to do. George, I'll tell you what I'd like you to do. I, I'd like you to drop everything. I have this fun little assignment I think you'll enjoy. There are some uh, reps in from the Houston Astros for talks on that interleague play, and I want you to show them a good time. This bastard over here says, let's call the sons of bitches, go visit them in New York. <laughs> well, we're certainly glad that you can make it. <laughs> I like your organization, George. <laughs> We've been talking to a real friendly son of a bitch in the front office. <laughs> Wilhelm, I think his name. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah Mr. Wilhelm, yeah. He told us that George Costanz is going to be taking us bastards out on the town. <laughs> I said that son of a bitch doesn't know what he's got in the store for. <laughs> Finish your drink? Oh, yeah, oh, almost, almost. Well, let's get that bastard bring us another round, huh? <laughs> you a big drinker, George? Well, maybe not as much as this bastard. <laughs> Is that you, George? <laughs> yeah, it's me. Is this Clayton? Well, listen, you son of a bitch. You know where we are? Oh, 30,000 feet above your head, you bastard. Well, what are they doing letting your bastards out of an airplane? Don't they know that's against FAA regulations? Hush up now. I can't hear it. Listen, I want you guys to send along those agreements the minute you land. Our boys can't wait to kick your butts. When's that bastard coming to Houston? Hey, Zeke wants to know when you Yankee bastards are coming to Houston. <laughs> you tell that son of a bitch no Yankee is ever coming to Houston. Not as long as you bastards are running things. Hey, now, now speak up, George. I can't hear you. You tell that son of a bitch no Yankee is ever coming to Houston. Not as long as you bastards are running things. George, 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 get a hold of yourself. Mr. What's the matter with you? <laughs> You wanted to see me, Mr. Steinbrenner? Yes, George. Come in, come in. George, word has it you've been cracking you under the pressure. Can't cope, can't stand the heat. Spit the bit. Uh, Mr. Steinbrenner, I can explain. Oh, we all get a little cuckoo sometimes, George. I used to be like you, raiding personnel till they cried, calling managers on the field during a game, threatening to move the team to New Jersey just to upset people. And then I found a way to relax. I've got two words to say to you, George. Hot tub. What a great clip from Seinfeld. It really captures dramaturgy its essence and how it can be applied in a workplace context so think about it for a second in reality if such a thing even exists george is one of the laziest people that you'll ever know but by pretending to look busy all the time he projects the impression that he's a hard worker and remember it's the impression that counts the impression that matters not the reality. <clears throat> okay, let's turn our attention to the maintenance of expressive control. Inevitably, the reality that we want to project to others is on occasion disrupted. This is often the result of a mistake that discredits our performance. Think about that scene at the end of The Wizard of Oz where Toto the dog 
pulls back the curtain to show that the wizard is actually just a fake, just a phony. We've all been, I think, in such situations where we pretend to be someone that we're not. Or sometimes we just don't behave in accordance with the social rules for that particular situation. Dauphin defines an unmeant gesture as anything that inadvertently or accidentally throws doubt on the projected reality. Examples of unmeant gestures include farting or burping or falling over. Now imagine that you've come to visit me during my office hours. You want to project the image of a hardworking and dedicated student, but during our discussion, you let out a massive smelly fart. My guess is that this would probably disrupt the impression that you are trying to create to me. Falling over is another really good example of an unmeant gesture. Years back, Julia Gillard, the former Prime Minister of Australia, was visiting India. Now, as she walks through a grass courtyard, she's filmed by the news falling spectacularly and shattering the professional image that she was trying to project. So if you haven't seen this clip, uh, I would urge you to check it out. It is quite humorous. Just type in uh, to YouTube, Julia Gillard falls over during India visit. So Goffman argues that you can show too much or too little preparation in these unmeant gestures. Too much preparation might include blatantly forced emotions during a performance. And too little preparation might include, for example, forgetting your lines or study, uh, stuttering or appearing nervous or inappropriate outbursts. Before entering a social situation, we often think about what we're gonna say, a sales pitch, if you will. But then for whatever reason, on occasion, we just end up jumbling up our lines uh, and failing to create the right impression. And believe me, this happens all the time with professors. So when there is an unmeant gesture, this often results in embarrassment, although context is key here. For example, if you let out a fart in McDonald's, this might be perceived by your audience as somewhat less embarrassing than farting in a fancy restaurant. Anyway, the key here, uh, as I said, is that performances are fragile and even the slightest mistake can lead to failure to define the situation. Goffman points out that our performances or our interactions are often sustained by lies and deceptions. We regularly mislead other people because again, we want to define the situation and control the reality that's being presented. Misrepresentation is extremely widespread. And according to Goffman, the only reason we don't lie all the time is that when our lies are discovered by the audience, we feel guilt or shame, humiliation, and sometimes we experience a loss of reputation, which keeps us in check. Because we all regularly lie in our own performances, we also regularly expect others to lie to us in their performances. For this reason, audiences are constantly on the lookout for misrepresentations. Ironically, we lie to each other frequently, but we don't like being lied to. We are particularly antagonistic towards what Goffman calls an imposter. An imposter is someone who has no right to play a particular role. Some imposters are even against the law. You can't pretend, for example, to be a doctor or a lawyer. Other imposters are judged less harshly, but judged nevertheless. As a salesperson, for example, you may pretend to be an expert on a certain product, but when placed under the microscope, your knowledge simply falls apart. On occasion, the audience will be tactful when they discover that the performer has misrepresented themselves. Audiences sometimes know that the performance is a sham, 
but they play along just to save the performer from embarrassment. This is especially the case where the audience uncovers a white lie or a lie that is intended to save or to protect the audience. However, we're much less forgiving when it comes to open or flat, or as Goffman calls them, barefaced lies, where the performer intentionally sets out to mislead the audience, again, often out of self-interest. Interestingly, Goffman argues that we often avoid open lies by using ambiguous language to communicate with each other. A classic example of this is something like, oh, I was just kidding. I was only kidding. Uh, you may claim to others that you have a degree from Harvard, uh, but when the audience finds out that you don't, you claim that it was always just a joke and that you weren't being serious. So you've probably seen a pattern emerging here, and that's that what's real is not only irrelevant, but it's also essentially unknowable. There is no one reality, but rather different shades of reality or maybe realities. This is a very postmodern concept. The performance may appear real, sincere, genuine, and honest, but that doesn't actually make it real. It could very well be contrived or fabricated. Now, sometimes as an audience member, you find out that it's fabricated, but sometimes you don't, right? So according to Goffman, no one is completely genuine or real. All our performances are at least in part contrived or fabricated to create an impression that may or may not be real. The key to success is to make the audience believe that the performance is real regardless of whether or not it actually is real, right? And the truth is that we're actually pretty good at this. Goffman would argue that human beings are quite effective and versatile in creating real looking performances. We have what he calls anticipatory socialization. This means that we accumulate experience over years and years that allows us to adapt to different performances in different social contexts. And we're pretty good at it. We just know how we should act in a situation based on our previous knowledge and experiences. We know, for example, when we walk into a room and we see that there's a funeral, that we need to act solemnly and respectfully. We know when we enter a room and we find people engaging in a party, that we can maybe let loose a bit and enjoy ourselves. So what we're doing is we're constantly looking for cues in the environment or the setting, which tell us how we should behave in that particular circumstances. And as I said, we're pretty good at interpreting those cues. Okay, so that's the end of this week's lecture. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week. Bye now.